here in just a few moments. Oh, okay. Just get a thumbs up from you students just to make sure are you good to go on your end? Perfect. All right, with that then we'll get started. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Amanda Pfeiffer. I am an education coordinator with the Canadian Light Source. Welcome to another Students on the Beamline seminar. Um, this one brought to you from students from St. Thomas More Collegiate in Burnaby, BC. Um, before we get into their seminar, just have a couple of housekeeping items to get through. Um, so as you saw, um, we are live streaming through YouTube. Um, so if you want to keep your videos off, for those of you on the call, more than welcome to. Um, the students will also be sharing a couple of videos in their uh, seminar, so that might, keeping videos off might also help with bandwidth. Um, we are also, or they, are also joined by um, audience in their library, I believe, um, just to keep in mind. But uh, for those that are joining in on the Zoom call, you do have some layout options. So in the top right-hand corner, you should see a, a view icon and you can change the um, viewing layout. Um, and you can also pin the students or Joe Muse um, to see the speakers as, as they present. The other thing I'd like to mention, um, we will have a Q&A session at the end. Um, so if you do have questions, feel free to unmute yourself or post it in the chat, raise your hand, um, and the students will address it. And as well, we'll be taking questions from those that are in the audience as well um, in, in the library. And yeah, I think that's about it. So um, like I said, this is a Students on the Beam Line seminar brought to you through um, students connecting from St. Thomas More Collegiate in Burnaby, BC. Um, since about April, 2021, um, the group has been looking at a project that examines uh, battery degradation, nickel speciation, cycling and temperatures. Um, and they've been fortunate enough to collaborate with Nano One uh, materials and Tesla, as well as collaborate with their CLS mentors, uh, Dr. Jigang Zhou, and as well as Dr. David Muir. And so with that, the students are gonna share what they found out on the Ideas Beamline. So take it away. Good afternoon and a big welcome to everyone. We're the 2022 St. Thomas More Collegiate Beamline team. Thank you for joining us today as we share experience and findings from conducting virtual research on the IDEAS beamline at the Canadian Light Source. The goal of our research project is to investigate the potential effects of cycling and temperature stresses on lithium ion batteries, hence the title of the seminar, Batteries on the Beamline. As part of STMC's Truth and Reconciliation journey, we acknowledge that we are on the ancestral and unceded homelands of the Hankaneum and Squamish speaking peoples and extend appreciation for the opportunity to operate the school on this territory. We also acknowledge that our Nanawan samples were collected from the traditional territory of the Hankaneum and Squamish speaking peoples and that our Tesla samples were collected from the unceded territory of the Kumeyaay Nation. We extend thanks for receiving these samples and are greatly appreciative of the growth and learning they brought about in our lives. The CLS in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan is located on Treaty 6 land in the traditional territories of the Nehiwak, Anishinaabe, Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota nations, and the homeland of the Métis. As students, we respect Indigenous ways of knowing and oral traditions. We dedicate ourselves to moving forward in the spirit of partnership, reconciliation, and collaboration. So just a little bit about who we are. We attend St. Thomas More Collegiate, abbreviated as STMC, a Catholic independent high school located in Burnaby, British Columbia, that was established in 1960 and has around 700 students from grades eight to 12. Uh, we are also the fourth Beamline team to uh, come from SDMC. Uh, as you can see on the map, we are situated about 1,200 kilometers from the CLS. And to the left is a picture of our school and track, as well as our group photo. Uh, our group name is the Charging Knights, a play on words with our school's mascot, a knight, and connection with batteries and our experiment using the team or the term charging. We will all quickly introduce ourselves and talk about our plans for next year. 
So hi everyone, my name is Jenna Vivacqua. I'm in grade 12 and next year I'll be studying sustainable agriculture at university. Hi everyone, my name is Angelina Chen and next year I'll be going to UBC to attend their general sciences program. Hi, my name is Sydney Christensen and next year I'll be studying applied sciences at UBC. Hi, my name is Brandon Delazari, uh, and next year I will be attending my grade 12 year at STMC. Uh, hello, I'm Cameron DeWith, and next year I'll be going to University of Toronto for mechanical engineering uh, with the hope of going into renewable energy or electric vehicles. Hi, my name is William Kong. Next year I will be attending UBC's uh, Applied Science Program for Materials Engineering. Hi, my name is Joshua Largo, and I'll be attending UBC for their Applied Sciences program. Hi, my name is Monica Wasosmik, and I will be attending Queen's University in the fall for astrophysics. Hi, my name is Hannah Van Spienung, and I will be doing nursing at Vancouver Island University next year. Hello, my name is Sophia Wong, and I'll be attending UBC in the program of Food, Nutrition, and Health Science. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Eric Zhang and next year I'll be attending the University of Waterloo for software engineering. And uh, let's not forget Mr. Joe Muse, our teacher coordinator who is seated, seated at the back who made this project possible. Our research question is, how does temperature during cycling affect the chemical composition of a lithium ion pouch cell? We hypothesize that as temperature and number of cycles increases, the lithium ion batteries will degrade faster. Picture to the right is a Tesla pouch cell. We experienced that smartphones have a decrease in battery life when exposed to extreme temperatures. And we have observed that as electrical devices are used over time, their battery life also decreases, which suggests a potential relationship between cycle and electrolyte degradation. Now that you know the team, the general idea and aim for our project, I would like to start off with a couple introductory topics. Lithium ion batteries play a huge role in the daily life of every person in this room, both virtually and in person. From powering our cell phones, computers, and electric toothbrushes, all the way to power tools and appliances, lithium ion batteries are what makes this ever growing electronic world a possibility. One of the most current applications of lithium ion batteries globally and nationally is the production of electric cars such as the Teslas that those here in Vancouver see on an hourly basis. How many of you own an electric vehicle? By 2035, Canada's hope will be for everyone in this room to be raising their hands when asked about owning an electric vehicle. Just this past March, the Minister of, in of Innovation, Science and Industry, the Premier of Ontario and the Mayor of Windsor announced that their governments are welcoming a total investment of over 5 billion Canadian dollars to manufacture batteries for electric vehicles in Canada. A little more current and local, a month ago on May 18th, the Ministry of Natural Resources in BC announced a $3.5 million investment to help support the installation of up to 810 electric vehicle chargers, chargers across the province. As many of you know, electric vehicles are rapidly on the rise here in Canada and the sales, funding, and production of these vehicles will only continue to grow over the next decade as Canada continues to reach their long-term goal of ensuring all new passenger vehicles sold in Canada are zero emission by 2035. While the previous slide provided some context as to how impactful lithium-ion batteries have become in society, the big question still remains. Why is our research important? This answer is split into three main parts. First off, reducing electronic waste. Electronic wastes are devi electronic devices that are nearing its end of life, which are then discarded or recycled. In 2019, the global e-waste monitor revealed a total of 53.6 million metric tons of e-waste created. To give you some context, in 2019, the global population was 7.7 .7 billion. This means there was roughly 6,900 grams of e-waste per person per year, which is equivalent to the weight of roughly 40 iPhones. In addition, our research is significant due to its impact on global warming. With temperatures changing to drastic levels, the batteries that are becoming commonplace in households and businesses across the globe must be able to accommodate these changes. 
As previously mentioned, current batteries degrade faster in extreme temperatures. Consequently, if average temperatures rise to the level they were at last year, you will not only eventually have a shortage of batteries, but greater amounts of electronic waste. Lastly, with increasing gas prices, more people are seeking to purchase electric vehicles. Due to high gas prices, lithium ion batteries will need to become more affordable in order for consumers to be incentivized to purchase electric vehicles, which will not only save gas usage, but will also help the environment. We tested pouch cells from both Nano One, a local battery manufacturer, and Tesla for our research project. A pouch cell is a softer type of lithium ion cell in which all the cell components are enclosed in an aluminum cover. We chose to study this particular type of lithium ion cell because unlike other cells coated in heavier metals, the soft aluminum shell doesn't prevent the beam line from inspecting the inner contents of the cell. The pouch cells we received from Tesla were prototypes for the new Model Y batteries. For years, Tesla has bought their batteries from external companies, but they are making lithium ion batteries themselves for the first time. Cells of nearly identical composition to the ones we have experimented with will be, will be packaged into larger cylindrical bases, batteries as seen, in the, as seen in the picture, which will then be used as the power source in the new Model Y vehicles. The pouch cells we received from Nano One are also part of new research and production. Until recently, almost all lithium ion cells have, has, have used the element cobalt in their design. Unfortunately, cobalt is unethically harvested by poor families and children in the D Democratic Republic of Congo. Nano One has constructed a new design for lithium ion pouch cells without the use of cobalt, and it is these cobalt free cells that we have had the privilege of experimenting with throughout our project. So this is a brief overview on the lithium ion battery structure. The negative terminal is called the anode. There oxidation occurs, which means that electrons represented by E flow through an external wire to the cathode. The red spheres represent the cathode material and the gray hexagons represent the anode material. The gray box in between the anode and the cathode represents the electrolyte and the blue ovals within that box represent the solvent molecule. The electrolyte allows for only lithium ions represented by pink spheres to enter from the anode to the cathode. So cycling involves the full charge and discharge of a battery or cell via reduction and oxidation reactions. Our electrical devices undergo charging and discharging. Charging means to plug your phone and discharging means using your phone. Essentially, cycling means to discharge to a constant discharge depth and to charge to a specific capacity. The pouch cells we received have been cycled using a battery cycler, which enables us to specify the rate and the depth of charge, as well as um, the depth of charge and discharge to ensure consistency. All right, so through the remainder of our presentation, we'll be focusing on something called an oxidation state. As by studying oxidation states of the elements at hand, we're able to see evidence of degradation. So an oxidation state is something we can give to each element in a compound that tells us it's real or apparent charge. During a chemical reaction, different elements or compounds can transfer electrons between each other, so their oxidation state can change. So when a particular species loses electrons in a reaction, it becomes less negative, and therefore its oxidation state goes up. This is called oxidation. On the flip side, as the species gains electrons in a reaction, it becomes more negative. So its oxidation state decreases. This is called reduction. A good way to remember this is the saying, Leo the lion goes ger. Leo being loss of electrons is oxidation and ger being gain of electrons is reduction. So if you draw your attention to the image on screen, uh, you will see that the yellow circle starts off with two electrons or those two little red dots and the green has none. This is the beginning of the reaction. Then as the reaction proceeds right, the two electrons from the yellow uh, species are donated to the green species. As a result, the yellow circle loses electrons and is oxidized, so its oxidation state would go up. The green circle gains those electrons and is reduced, so its oxidation state will go down. So now we're going to look a little deeper as to what actually happens when we charge and discharge a lithium ion pouch cell. So the image above demonstrates the internal contents of a typical lithium ion battery. On the left is the cathode, 
which in our cells is composed of a compound containing lithium, nickel, manganese, and some other elements. The green circles that are moving in the image, those represent the lithium ions. And the red and yellow circles that are in the cathode are the other elements that are found in the cathode. On the right, you'll notice the anode, and the little gray structures in the anode is graphite. The blue jelly in between the two sides is the electrolyte, and the little baby blue dots are the electrons. As the battery is charged, an external power source causes electrons to flow from the cathode to the anode. As you can see, uh, the little dots traveling through the wire, that's the movement of electrons through an external wire to the anode. During the charging process, lithium ions also migrate from the cathode to the anode. This is demonstrated by the green dots moving from left to right in the video above. Thinking back to oxidation states on the slide before, you will notice that during charging, electrons are removed from the cathode. This means that during charging, elements in the cathode become more positively charged, and we would expect some of their oxidation states to increase. So once the lithium ion battery is charged, we can then use the battery to create energy. This process is called discharging the battery. When a lithium ion battery is discharging, electrons travel from the anode back to the cathode, so in the opposite direction as before. You can see this in the video when the little blue dots travel from the anode through an external wire through the light bulb and back into the cathode. It is this movement of electrons on the external wire that can be used to create energy, to power our phones, or to power our devices, or to power our cars. In this case, the movement of electrons creates energy that would make the light bulb glow. In our phones, movement of electrons would power our phones to work. At the same time, the lithium ions in the anode migrate back to the cathode. You can see this in the video as the little green circles move from right to left, where they eventually bond with the elements in the cathode. During this uh, discharging, the cathode gains electrons. This means as the electrons move back to the cathode, the metals in the cathode undergo reduction. They become more negatively charged. And thus, we would expect them to have a lower oxidation state than they did when the battery was charged. Another thing to quickly point out relates to the little hill that appears at the top of the screen in the corner every so often. In general, electrons want to be in the, uh, in the cathode. Um, to do this, to get them to the anode, we require the use of external energy to move them to that side. This is just like rolling a ball up a hill. We use energy to get the ball to the top of the hill, and once it's at the top of the hill, it has the potential energy to fall back down. Similarly, when we use energy to move electrons to the anode, they have the potential to move back to the cathode, so they have potential energy. Furthermore, when a battery discharges, the electrons move back to the cathode like they want to do. During this movement, the potential energy the electrons had in the anode turns into electrical energy. This is analogous to a ball rolling down a hill, as the potential energy it had at the top of the hill transform into moving energy, which is why they have that little picture at the top corner. So one more thing to point out that's really important for our project is relates to how battery degradation occurs in these cells. So when a lithium ion battery is charged for the very first time, and the lithium ion batteries pass through the SCI layer, they actually can react with, I mean, pass through the electrolyte, they actually can re react with the electrolyte, that little blue jelly, and form something called the SCI layer. And in this layer, it's a hard, a hard layer that forms um, right in the anode there, and the lithium ions can get trapped in this layer. And once they're trapped in this layer, they no longer are free to move from anode to cathode. So what we see is a loss of mobile, mobile lithium ions. And this is important because what creates energy in a cell is a movement of charge. So when we consume some of the mobile ions, not, not as much charge is able to transport throughout the cell. So the battery degrades, it's not able to operate as well as it could before. So even though the good thing is, luckily, after this SCI layer forms for the first time, it doesn't continue to grow that much as we keep using the cell over and over again. However, as we look at degradation in lithium ion battery cells, it often can be traced back to the loss of lithium ions or mobile lithium ions. Next, we will introduce the samples we received and how they were prepared at the CLS and at Nano One. So approximately a year ago, we connected with uh, 2008 STMC alumni, Andrew Pires, who works as a battery engineer at Tesla. He gave us really great insight on our project and gave us suggestions on what temperatures we should cycle our batteries at. 
specifically in the 40 to 55 degrees Celsius range, because as we increase the temperature of a cell, we increase the resistance during charging. But he also said that we should knock over 60 to 70 degrees Celsius. And we took that into advice and did between, we did 20 to 40 degrees Celsius. We received 15 pouch cells that were cycled at the CLS. Here's a quick introduction to the chemical composition of our Tesla cells. Tesla pouch cells contain NMC811 cathodes, which means they are composed of nickel, manganese, and cobalt in the respective ratio of eight to one to one. While Tesla pouch cells contain lithium, manganese, cobalt, and oxygen, the focal point that we will be looking at is nickel. Tesla pouch cells also have a layered structure, which means the crystal lattice of the chemical compounds in the cathode are stacked in layers, as you can see from the diagram to the right. We expect that when our Tesla cells are charged, the oxidation state of the nickel in the cathode should increase, whereas when the cells are discharged, the oxidation state of nickel should decrease. Any differences in nickel's oxidation state between our five test cells could indicate battery degradation. So we received 15 pouch cells from Tesla. They were shipped preloaded between two polycarbonate sheets to contain swelling and internal resistance. At the beginning of May, our mentor, Dr. Zhao, cycled four at varying numbers of charge slash discharge cycles and at varying temperatures at the CLS. As you can see here, we have our TC is our control, which wasn't cycled at all, and so temperature is irrelevant. And our T1 is our first Tesla cell at 50 cycles at 20 degrees Celsius. Our second one at 100 cycles at 20 degrees Celsius our third 50 cycles at 40 degrees Celsius, and our fourth at 100 cycles at 40 degrees Celsius. We had originally wanted to go slightly higher with the temperature to see more damage perhaps, um, and also go negative, but due to the limitations on the cycler and how many um, cells it could handle and at what temperatures, we agreed upon these conditions. <laughs> Um, also around a year ago, we met with um, the chief technical officer of Nano One, Dr. Stephen Campbell, and he, Nano One is a local lithium ion battery company that makes cells specifically without cobalt, as Sydney explained beforehand. He gave us a really great presentation on general battery knowledge that helped us form our hypothesis, specifically to look at the cathode, because the anode is graphite, which is so light that x-rays from the beam lines can go straight through it, so it's basically invisible. And that's why we study the cathode. He sent us five handmade lithium ion pouch cells that we came pre-cycled. We will now introduce the chemical composition of our nano one cells and what we expect to happen to the oxidation states of the metals in their cathodes. Nano one pouch cells contain LNMO cathodes, which means they are composed of lithium, nickel, manganese, and oxygen without any cobalt. Nano one cells also have a spinel structure, which means the crystal lattice of chemical compounds in the cathode forms the shape of a spiral, as you can see from the diagram on the right here. And I'll skip. We expect that when our nano one cells are discharged, nickel and the cathode should be in a plus two oxidation state. And when the cells are charged, Nickel and the cathode should be oxidized to plus four due to the removal of lithium ions from the cathode. The oxidation state of manganese should remain the same at plus four and any other oxidation state in the cathode could indicate battery degradation. As mentioned before, we received five pouch cells from Nano One, four that were cycled at Nano One and were shipped in a completely discharged state to the CLS at varying charge slash discharge cycles. All cells were cycled at 25 degrees Celsius, Celsius at plus or minus 0 0.1 degrees. If I can bring your attention to the final um, column, we can see that our control um, battery is a dry cell. It has no electrolyte in the middle. And so that one was not cycled at all. Our first nano one cell, if you look at the end, we can see that 
the C is the rated capacity of the cell in milliamp hours. And the denominator is the time in hours. So for example, for the N1 and N2 cells, we have, um, it's a 1C rate, which is the current it takes to charge slash dis discharge a cell in one hour. So for our N3 and N4 cells, this, it takes four hours to charge slash discharge these cells. This equals then the rated capacity, which you can see in column three, divided by the number of hour, hours, and that is equal to the available amperage at that rate. Also, as you can see in the orange and the purple, you can see that the initial capacity is, uh, is higher than the rated capacity for our N1 and N2 cells, but in N3 and N4, it's the same. All cells degrade during operation, so they deliver less capacity at extremely high currents. So the rated capacity should be less than the initial capacity as seen with those cells in the orange and purple. Um, but um, those cycled fewer than that did not see this change as they weren't cycled enough times. So taking a look after cycling our cells, uh, we did notice a few changes. Uh, to preface, our nano one cells were cycled prior to arrival at the CLS, as mentioned earlier, and only our Tesla cells were actually cycled at the CLS. From our Tesla cells, cell T4 endured the most extreme conditions and showed capacity loss, starting with a one amp hour lifetime and dropping to a 0.86 amp hour lifetime. This just means that the amount of charge the battery can deliver decreased. You can sort of think of it like when you have an older phone and it dies quicker, that's because the battery's capacity has decreased. Though the rest of our Tesla cells showed none of this capacity loss. From our Nano 1 cells, N1, N2, and N3 swelled with gas, N3 showing the most severity, while N4 did not produce any gas. Uh, on the screen, we provided an image. Uh, NC is our control cell, and you see that it's sort of flat, and N2 sort of has expansion in it, which is the gas that formed. Um, the gas was observed upon opening the packages of the cells at the CLS by Dr. Zhao. We are uncertain when exactly the production of gas occurred, as well as what the gas is, but because a gas was produced, it could sustain evidence towards degradation of the anode, which is composed of graphite. Additionally, it is typical of lithium ion pouch cells to swell when subjected to high temperatures, which does follow up with the conditions the cells were subjected to. With gas production, the solid electrolyte interface or SEI layer gradually thickens during repeated charge discharge cycling. After the original generation of the SEI layer, during, with the anode volume change and electrolyte diffusion, the SEI layer fracturing can occur and cause graphite exposure to the electrolyte. The gas species and generation rate also depend on the material selection and the opening condition, operating conditions, which is why we can infer that the gas produced is most likely carbon dioxide because the anode is composed of carbon. Uh, Brandon is now going to talk a little bit about the CLS and the ideas beamline. The Canadian light source is a particle accelerate, ac accelerator that accelerates electrons to 99.998% the speed of light. It then bends those electrons with magnets and other devices to produce extremely powerful light rays through a process known as Bremstelung radiation. These light rays are then used to perform experiments. The beamline that we had access to is the IDEAS beamline, and it uses X-rays in the range of 2,200 electron volts to 13,400 electron volts. This relates to the elements that the IDEAS beamline can detect. We used X-ray fluorescence and X-ray absorption near edge structure to analyze our batteries. We also conducted our experiment in situ, meaning we did, we did not need to take the cells apart in order to study them. <clears throat> Next, I'll introduce the XREF technique and Eric will explain our XREF data. So XRF is a non-destructive analytical technique. XRF is used to find the elemental composition of a sample. It does this by taking a sample and having it be hit by a primary source of X-rays and then measuring the secondary or fluorescent X-rays that are emitted. These secondary X-rays that are emitted are created by the primary photons knocking out electrons from the atoms of a sample. 
This causes the atom to become excited and to go back to normal, an electron from a higher energy level must drop down. In order to do that, it must release energy, which it does so in the form of emitting a photon. We can then measure the energy of that photon and from that can determine what element or yeah, what element the photon came from. XRF has a large range of elements that it can detect, but it is limited by the beamline's energy level. For instance, ideas can measure from element phosphorus to element krypton. In our XRF data, we identified the elements of manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, and copper, all in the range of, for our beamline to detect. Each element peaks at a specific energy level provided by the beamline. For example, a peak at 8,000 8, electron volts signifies the presence of copper. The higher the peak, the higher the relative concentration of that element. This is an example of an XRF graph of one of our Tesla batteries, T4. This graph indicates copper is the most prominent element as it has the highest peak. Although it's not a cathode material, copper is an important conductive material used in the battery. Iron is also detected, and we believe this is because it is used for structural purposes. Cobalt is also detected in very trace amounts, which is a, a cathode material. There was not much manganese detected, although it is a cathode material. This is our XRF data for all the Tesla batteries. We have applied an offset to the curve of each one of our five battery samples to display them all on one graph. We refer to this as a waterfall graph. As you can see, all of these consist of relatively the same elemental composition and very similar relative abundances of elements. These being trace amounts of manganese, cobalt, and large am larger amounts of iron, nickel, and copper. This is in line with the battery chemistry data we received from Tesla, which states that the cathode materials contain 80% nickel, 10% manganese, and 10% cobalt. Here's a similar waterfall graph, but for our five nano one batteries. Note that manganese is detected in higher amounts while cobalt is not present. This is in line with the battery chemistry that nano one provided, which suggests that the cathode is a lithium nickel manganese oxide composition. To the left are the cathode materials of the two different brands of batteries. Notice that Tesla has nickel, manganese, and cobalt in an eight to one to one ratio while nano one has a nickel to manganese ratio of one to three. To even better see the differences between the elemental composition of our Tesla and nano one batteries, we average the values of the five Tesla pouch cell samples and then our five nano one pouch cell samples. The y-axis here can be used to measure the relative abundance of every individual element. As you can tell, nano one batteries have a higher relative uh, abundance of manganese, iron, and copper, while the Tesla batteries have more nickel and cobalt. This is perfectly in line with the cathode material formula provided by both companies on the left. So next we will be discussing the Zanes technique and the Zanes data that we gathered. So Zanes or X-ray absorption near its structure is another non-destructive analytical technique that we performed in situ, meaning we did not disassemble or damage the cells to study them. Much like XRF, Zanes uses incoming photons to measure the fluorescence of a sample, but Zanes focuses on, focuses on a single element as opposed to a range of elements. And the reason that you use Zanes is to try to figure out the oxidization state of the element that you're testing for. So how does Zanes work? Zanes works by starting the incoming photon beam at an energy, energy level where the element would not be excited because the beam lacks enough energy to knock out the electrons. We see this at the pre-edge of the graph and then over time, increasing the energy all the way to the post edge where most of the photons are exciting the element of interest. For example, this is a graph of our nickel reference foil and it starts at around 8,325 electron volts, which is the pre-edge, and it goes all the way to around 8,425 electron volts, which is the post edge. Uh, so in the reference graph on the right, the nickel and nickel oxide is in an oxidation state of plus two. The energy for nickel oxide in electron volts is just over 8,350. On our graph of discharged Tesla cells, we see the nickel peak occurring at about 8,355 electron volts, suggesting a slightly higher oxidation state than plus two. Based on our knowledge of Tesla cells gleaned from various experts, the oxidation state should be around plus 2.6, 
which is an average value of the nickel oxidation state in the cells, which lines up with our data. All five cells show virtually no change, or sorry, show virtually identical graphs. Even T4, which was cycled 100 times at 40 degrees Celsius and showed capacity loss from one amp hour to 0.86 amp hours, did not show different nickel oxidation states when compared against other Tesla cells. The peak pictured in the last slide occurred at about 8,355 electron volts. The peak pictured here is shifted slightly to the right of that, which suggests that the oxidation state of nickel increased. This makes sense based on what we know about the Tesla cells from the experts we met with, because when the cells are in a charged state, the nickel oxidation state should be above plus three. Similar to the last slide, we see no notable difference between the nickel oxidation states in various cells. Even T4, which was cycled at the highest temperature for the most cycles, showed no change when compared against other Tesla cells. Just to touch back on our research question, our team asked, how does temperature during cycling affect the chemical composition of a lithium ion pouch cell? The Tesla cells we tested showed no variation in nickel oxidation states, and even T4, which endured 100 cycles at 40 degrees Celsius, showed no notable change in nickel oxidation state, despite showing capacity loss, which suggests that our hypothesis may have been incorrect in asserting that higher temperature will result in more degradation. Alternatively, we may not have probed our cells enough to really test our hypothesis's accuracy. Now that we've looked at um, Zane's graphs of nickel and Tesla pouch cells, we'll move on to discussing nickel and nano one and nano one pouch cells. We have completed a Zane scan on each of our five discharged nano one cells, and the blue and the light blue curve here is our nickel metal reference. By overlapping our graphs, we can identify that the graphs of our four experimental group samples, N1, N2, N3, and N4, are very similar in shape. One key difference that is shown here is the orange curve, uh, which is our control group sample, NC, that has not been cycled at all. We are able to see notable change as soon as the cells begin to be cycled, namely a slightly lower peak energy on our control cell. This is quite an interesting observation. There are some differences in the spectra, and this would certainly correlate to some composition change in the cells during initial cycling. Let's now zoom in on this slight discrepancy. Shown here is a close-up view of the peak from the previous slide. The curve of the control sample has a visibly higher normalized photon count, the y-axis, at a lower peak energy, x-axis, than the other cells that have, that have been cycled. The composition change shown here ties back to the concept of electrolyte degradation and loss of mobile lithium ions that Jenna mentioned earlier. When a cell is charged for the first time, lithium ions will migrate to the anode and react with the electrolyte, forming a solid layer that traps lithium ions. This is known as the solid electrolyte interface or SEI layer. SEI layer growth consumes lithium ions and makes lithium transport more difficult. In other words, initial cycling results in a decrease in the number of mobile lithium ions, which we infer is the change in chemical composition that would result in the pattern shown here in this Zane's graph. The highest read line here is the Zane scan for the control nano one battery control nano one cell that has never been cycled. As there is no degradation associated with this unused cell, the nickel in the cathode at its current discharge state has an oxidation state of plus two. Then if you look at the Zane scans for all four cycled cells, they appear to be shifted slightly to the right. This shift, this shift indicates an increase in the oxidation state of nickel. So why is this related to battery degradation? When electrons and lithium ions are removed from the cathode during charging, the nickel in the cathode becomes nickel plus four. Then when the cell discharges during use, the lithium ions and electrons move back to the cathode, reducing nickel back to an oxidation state of plus two. However, because some mobile lithium ions were trapped in the SCI layer after the cell was charged, 
Not as many lithium ions and electrons are available to reduce the nickel in the cathode when the cell discharges. As a result, not all of the nickel is able to return back to a plus two oxidation state, raising the oxidation state of nickel in the cathode slightly. Another thing to note is that despite this difference between the control cell and our experimental cells, there is no visible difference between the four experimental cells that have been cycled at varying number of cycles. This indicates that after the formation of the SEI layer, not much additional loss of lithium ions occurred in our cells, and this shows how capac cell capacity does not seem to be affected by the number of cycles that we expose the cells to. To see further degradation amongst the samples, future research may have to either increase the number of cycles or try to cycle the cells at different and drastic temperatures. Let's now briefly summarize what we observed from the Zanes graphs of the element nickel in our nano one pouch cells. Again, as a reminder, our research question is how does temperature during cycling affect the chemical composition of a lithium ion pouch cell? We did not vary the temperature at which our nano one cells were cycled, but we cycled them for different number of times. We have come to, come, we have come to several conclusions. One, the number of cycles seem to have minimal effect on the chemical composition of our nano one cells. And two, there was visible difference between our control cell and C and the other four cells that were cycled. We infer that this difference is related to the loss of mobile lithium plus ions due to the formation of the SEI layer, which therefore resulted in battery degradation. Also shown on the right here is a picture of our nano one cell N1 as it is mounted on the sample holder on the IDEAS beamline at the CLS. This is a non-water fault graph of a different element, manganese, in our nano one pouch cells. The general shape of our five graphs are once again quite similar, and the blue curve represents our manganese metal reference. If we try to match the general shape of this graph to some referencing graphs on the right, the bottom right, as shown on the slide here, we can see a great resemblance between our graphs and those of manganese plus two and manganese plus four. However, our Zanes graphs on manganese are much noisier than the previous Zanes graphs on nickel. Such high background noise is because there is less overall manganese than nickel in our nano one samples. If we have, for instance, 10 times less manganese than nickel in our nano one pouch cells, we would need to complete each Zane scan for 10 times as long in order to achieve the same amount of noise. The manganese concentration in our samples are so low, and therefore, as a result, the background noise in our samples are too high. Although we could not clean our current data with advanced analytical techniques um, in time before we presented our findings to you today in today's seminar, uh, there may be something interesting hidden in this data. We would need to run the scans for longer periods of time to get more precise data, so with less background noise, before drawing any conclusions. Uh, this graph contains in green the discharged nano uh, one nickel scans and in blue the discharged tesla nickel scans and in red the charged tesla nickel scans as you can see on the graph the red peak is shifted to the right of the blue peak which suggests a higher oxidation state this makes sense because when charged the nickel and tesla cells goes from an oxidation state of approximately plus 2.6 to an oxidation state above plus three as i mentioned earlier the peak of the line in green representing the nano one discharge cells is farther to the left than either the blue or the red line, which suggests that the oxidation state is lower than either the charged or discharged Tesla cells. Um, this makes sense as well, since the nickel in the nano one cells should be at plus two when discharged. As Angelina mentioned before, the cycled nano one cells had peaks shifted right when compared against the nano one control cell. Interestingly, peak heights are significantly different in the nano one versus Tesla cells. As we learned from the CLS staff, peak height is related to composition. So the nano one cathodes 
are a spinel structure, while the Tesla, Tesla cathodes are a layered structure, which could account for the difference in peak height, although we are not entirely sure. Uh, so we'll now jump into some of the conclusions that we drew from both our data and then the technique that we used. So the first conclusion our team drew from our data was that despite capacity loss in T4, which was cycled 100 times at 40 degrees Celsius, there was no visible change in the composition when compared against other cells. Um, this is very interesting and could be a result of a couple of things. Uh, first, the metals, anal metals analyzed, namely nickel and manganese, um, manganese in the nano one cells and then nickel in the Tesla as well, may not have been responsible for the degradation. The next possible conclusion is that degradation may not have occurred at the surface of the battery, um, may have just occurred at the surface of the battery only a few nanometers deep, resulting in capacity loss, but no visible change in the overall battery composition. And then finally, the number of cycles may not have been enough to result in significant degradation. And that might account for the reason that we see gas production in the nano one cells and the capacity loss in T4, but no visible composition change. And then the next conclusion that we drew was that despite our hypothesis, which predicted that cells cycled at highest temperature control, would show the most significant composition change, our Tesla cell composition did not change between cells, even in the cells cycled at the highest temperature control, which could suggest that our temperature variation was not significant enough to cause varying degradation, or it could suggest that the number of cycles was not enough to show a tangible composition difference between cells cycled at different temperature constraints. On the last slide, I drew conclusions about our cells based upon the Zanes data our team collected and analyzed. On this slide, I wanted to focus on drawing conclusions about the technique we use to analyze our cells in the Ideas Beamline. In an article published in Nature in 2018, it was said that advanced in situ slash operando synchrotron based x ray characterization techniques are powerful tools for providing valuable information about the complicated nature um, of reaction mechanisms in lithium ion batteries. In situ techniques allow for the scanning of samples without taking them apart, while operando techniques involve scanning a sample while it is being exposed to conditions. For our experiment, we used pellet cells because it allowed us to use in situ techniques, scanning our cells without disassembling them. While we did not use operando techniques in our experiment, the ideas beamline would allow for pouch cells to be cycled while Zane scans are being run, which could be an effective method to use in the future um, in helping to further understand how battery composition changes during cycling. The Zane study of pouch cell cathodes at ideas is a non-destructive characterization technique, which could be employed in future research. So uh, our project was somewhat beset by both technical and time-based factors. The first one being that we were unable, unfortunately, to cycle them below room temperature. This was because the cycler at CLS did not have the capability to do so. Also, we could not cycle them at higher temperatures. Otherwise, the explosives disposal unit would come knocking at our door asking, what are we doing with these batteries? Uh, secondly, our sample size is somewhat limited because we didn't take full use of all of the cells that Tesla sent us. Um, so we didn't, we also didn't have the time to actively perform experiments on them, uh, to fully understand Zanes, it is extremely complicated and it would need, it would require extensive quantum mechanics knowledge and probably a master's degree at a bare minimum, just to understand what goes into Zanes. This isn't exactly feasible for a group of 11 high school students, but we were still able to obtain information from our, from our experiments. Uh, we were also under a pretty strict timeline. Uh, by the time we had shipped, there were only a maximum of a couple of months to actually get them cycled at CLS. So it was a shame because we couldn't get more extreme data, which would have helped make the results clearer. And finally, we only had eight hours to operate the beam line, which limited the amount of overall scans we could do. So how could our research impact society? First of all, due to the complex nature of battery construction in general, uh, that area is not quite as mainstream as other fields. Like everyone knows what a battery is, but not many people know the intricacies of what goes into a battery. So hopefully this can raise a bit more awareness about the topic, especially within the younger generation. Uh, secondly, with the rising threat of climate change, the advent of cleaner energy is becoming an ever increasing, ever increasing priority. And as we've seen with the gas prices nowadays, the demand for electric vehicles is now becoming an increasing demand. 
In a similar vein, temperatures and weather conditions in Canada can fluctuate wildly and these factors exacerbate the degradation of batteries. If electric vehicles are supposed to be the way of the future, then that is a problem that needs to be solved. Uh, and as mentioned earlier, companies are investing more and more into battery research, probably because of the, our world is burning thing, which makes it an economically vi viable field to pursue in the future. Finally, a lot of student in the Beamline groups uh, focus a lot on organic composition rather than the technical stuff we're doing here. And as Cameron mentioned earlier, in situ techniques are extremely, are their very viable way to utilize the beam lines. So hopefully with this, we can broaden the scope for other student groups in the future. Uh, for future research, um, if we had more time, we would have scanned for cobalt and iron. Cobalt isn't in the Nano One batteries, but Tesla has it. So it would have been interesting to scan for it. While iron is slightly, I don't want to say pointless to look at, but it is more is more structural than the other elements that we looked at. Uh, still would have been interesting to look for it. Um, and also, we didn't have time uh, to look at the charged nano one cells, unfortunately. But um, if we were to do like a sequel, beam line, batteries on the beam line part two, uh, we would definitely prioritize that in the future. Um, we would also try and find a way to cycle them at colder temperatures because we weren't able to do that for this one. And we would try and get them shipped faster so that way we could get a higher number of cycles in and thus more conclusive data. So now just a few things about what we've learned about science in general from doing this project. Um, one big thing that we've learned is the importance of collaboration and how much that can really help you in the science world. When you first, you know, get into a project like this, I guess I, none of us really knew what to expect and it was a lot. And there's a lot of intricacies and new science techniques you got to pick up and it can be overwhelming. But forming really good re relationships with different people like Andrew Pires from Tesla, which is an alumni from our school, and Dr. Stephen Campbell, which has been so helpful, and the CLS staff, it's really helped us get through the process. Um, another thing that we've really learned is graphing skills which is gonna become hugely important when we come into you know, post-secondary next year. And a lot of us are pursuing science and graphing is a huge part of the science process. It helps you see data and has helped you find connections. And um, I feel like all of us have been able to see new connections between data that we actually weren't able to see before. And that's gonna help so many ways. And another thing is the scientific process. Just knowing that sometimes when you do science, it's not always a concrete answer. You know, you think you're gonna go into a experiment and come out with like the super explained answer of everything and you're just going to know everything but that's really never the case unless in if it is great but oftentimes it just involves a lot of thinking a lot of collaborating a lot of people contributing to research altogether from all over the world and then you kind of make the best hypothesis and best conclusions that you can and that's really what science is so it was a cool journey to learn all those new stuff about science and i hope to continue that learning and i hope about all of us hope to continue that learning next year in our future careers Uh, we'd like to do a quick reflection on how our research was impacted by COVID-19. Due to COVID-19, we were unable to actually physically go to the CLS and have the experience of data collection there, and instead we had to participate remotely. We were able to have a virtual tour of the CLS, as well as having our beam time virtually. Our beam, our beam time was held in our physics classroom from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., we were on a Zoom call with our team at the CLS the entire time as they collected our data and we formatted it all into graphs. Uh, this definitely impacted our learning experience primarily because we were unable to be physically present for the battery cycling as well as the XRF and Zane scannings. It was not as hands-on as it could have been, though science continues despite all the challenges we face. COVID-19 did not impact our preparations and initial research Close to all our meetings were virtual. Even without COVID-19, we would still have virtual meetings because most of the people we were in contact with do not live in BC. However, our communication was closely all online. Um, we should mention that it was a bit challenging to relay and receive information via email, such as when we were contacting some of the companies uh, that we were working with. It would often take a while to get responses from some people. 
Uh, but regardless, all of the virtual meetings were engaging and informative. We were fortunate enough to have Dr. Campbell come and talk to us about batteries in person. Ultimately, in spite of the pandemic, we were able to use our virtual and in-person meetings effectively in preparation for our beam time. Finally, we would like to give thanks to the important people that have helped us tremendously with our research. First off, we would like to thank Tesla and Nano One for providing us with their pouch cell samples. We are honored to have been given the opportunity, confidence, and trust to experiment on their batteries. In addition, we would like to thank the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, also known as NSERT, for the Promo Science Grant and the Canadian Light Source in Saskatchewan for the students on the BeamMind program for making this amazing experiment and research opportunity possible. Lastly, we would like to give a big thanks to everyone who has significantly helped us in our research, starting with our CLS staff, Amanda Pfeiffer, Anna Maria Beckler, James Gorin, and our CLS mentors, David Muir, Dr. Jugang Zhao, and our, inter and our external mentors, Andrew Pears, and Dr. Zhongin Yang from Tesla, Dr. Stephen Campbell and Perry Jura from Nano One, and last but not least, our physics teacher, Joe Muse, physics teacher, Joe Muse. We, like, we thank all these people for teaching, helping, and guiding us through this incredible research experience. Thank you. Thank you again to everyone for joining our Batteries on the Beamline seminar today. We will start with questions from the Zoom chat first. Is there any questions from anyone in the Zoom call? Amanda, may I ask a question? Of course. Uh, uh, students, uh, excellent talk. I really enjoy your presentation and all the, the whole process uh, working with you uh, on this project. Now I would like to challenge you uh, in the, for the last time. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned ideas uh, is uh, using ideas, uh, look at this porch cell. It's wonderful to do operando. Now the question is why you want to do operando experiment? What's the new information or the uh, unique information you will expect to be uh, to find from the operando experiment? Um, for using operando with the beam lines and ideas, you can definitely see how the composition changes uh, over time as you're cycling it. So as you're charging it, you should be able to see the oxidation state increasing. Then as you're discharging, you should see it decreasing, um, which could be really interesting to see it sort of more real time as the data is kind of coming in. Excellent, thank you. Just one more point is uh, there uh, during charge discharge, sometimes there's a non-stable phase. Uh, when you do the uh, non-operando, you will miss this part of information. But if you look at the process at the real time, you can um, pick up, catch the, the, this non-stable uh, structure. Otherwise you will miss it. But very good answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions from those uh, listening to us from online on the Zoom call? Um, I have a question. Uh, this is Renee Merzlach. Uh, uh, so anecdotally, I heard that cooler temperatures uh, also have a huge impact on battery health. And uh, I know that you weren't able to uh, use, you weren't able to test that given your, um, given the equipment that you had to be above room temperature. What equipment would you be, do you know what equipment you would be able to use to conduct experiments that are um, below room temperature, like let's say maybe closer to uh, temperatures that we experience in Canada in the winter time, like let's say four degrees or something like that. Just wondering. 
Um, so when we first came up with the research idea to cycle them at colder temperatures, we actually like were brainstorming ideas of charging batteries and even just fridges or freezers to get like that negative 12 or negative 40. But um, logistically trying to figure out how to get like a cord through a freezer or through a fridge was kind of difficult. Um, but with that being said, there probably is scientific gear out there that could charge batteries at colder temperatures that we just didn't have access to. And figuring out how to charge something in a fridge was a little bit beyond us at the moment. So um, that's a great question and probably something that would be great to look into scientific ways of charging things at four degrees Celsius. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what we, the, our thought process of uh, cycling them at cooler temperatures. Thanks, good work you guys. Thanks. Thank you. So we also had a question in the chat um, from Tess saying, great presentation. My question is, how did you decide on the topic? <laughs> oh, uh, okay, well, okay, uh, it was it was my idea, but there were other ideas too. Um, one of them was looking at the uh, biodegradable food containers, and there was another one about uh, salmon, yes, and bones as well. Uh, we chose this one just because uh, the previous Be Mind projects had all been uh, revolving around organic materials. And this would be the first project that we've done so far that applies the same techniques to something uh, artificial and man-made. So that was our reasoning behind choosing lithium-ion batteries this time around. Also, um, also because we live in Canada, where there's um, often like like depending on which region you live in, there's cooler temperatures. For instance, I think this past winter got really cold. At, like negative 15 to 20 degrees celsius or something i like to garden so i heard from my friends a lot of their plants died that's how i know about the uh, cooler winter here and so therefore um by studying lithium ion pouch cells and whether they do like what to what degree they degrade to um at different temperatures and seeing if we have potential solutions for that is very relevant and applicable to our daily lives here in canada and also you know, as many of us have mentioned already, um, the world of electric vehicles is growing. And so, you know, doing some research in this field and keeping ourselves infor informed and also introducing this concept of battery degradation about like everything about electro electronic vehicles to everyone here and on the Zoom call, we just thought it, it's quite meaningful. And yeah, that's another aspect of why we chose this project. I'm sure my Saskatchewan counterparts have their ears ringing when they hear the minus 15 that you had to deal with the extreme cold, but I won't get into that comment. I uh, don't want to spark some provincial rivalry, but um, we can open the floor to questions perhaps in the audience there in your library. If there's any questions they have. Oh no. How did you decide on uh, how many cycles you were going to, uh, to set that? Like, how did you decide on 100? How did you decide on 50? Um, well, at first, oh, oh sorry. The uh, yeah, so the question was, how do we decide on how many cycles we should expose each battery to? Um, the answer is a lot of that was due to how much time we had to actually cycle them. Uh, when we got the batteries, then we had to send them to the CLS. And then by the time they got there, we only had a few months before our, uh, our uh, scheduled beam time. So um, doing anything beyond 100 might have been a little unrealistic since it takes about an hour to charge them. And um, that's a lot of time and a lot of time from the scientists there doing it for us. So we had to choose our uh, cycle amounts in like a reasonable, reasonable time period. So in order to see a little bit of degradation, it was advised to us that maybe a 50 and 100 cycles would potentially show something. So that's how we, that's how we decided on that. Another question. This is Stephen Campbell from 901. I noticed that our cells are puffed up, but we'd already done the cycling off. So, what do you think is happening that what's driving that gas production story? Because it's not just how a lot they degrade when they run. Sometimes batteries and the guys at Tesla will know this. Sometimes they degrade when they're sitting on the shelf. And sometimes the fairly method you saw was the fact they puffed up. What do you think might be happening there? What's driving the reaction? Could it be historic geometric ratios? 
and the it's also the, the, the high voltage right because when you store when you storing a lot of energy into a battery you store a lot of chemistry in the materials they then become very high energy and they're able to do other side reactions to produce the gas yes. because you put energy in and it goes somewhere sometimes it goes where you don't want it to go so these yeah. cells even the tesla cells in the study conditions will pop up so when your cell fails, um, when your cell phone fails now, you will start thinking about what's going on inside the battery, and we will have succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> and there's also, uh, uh, it's like to keep your phone battery at maximum health, uh, keeping around 50% is the uh, recommended Absolutely. amount. Yeah. But when it's at zero or 100, that puts all the pressure applied um, with one side or the other. You're correct, yes. No wonder my batteries die so fast. <laughs> Anyways, just a quick recap. Um, uh, Dr. Stephen Campbell from Nano One just asked the question uh, about why we speculate, like what, what might be the reason of why <clears throat> the Nano One pouch cells, uh, I think, N1, N2, and especially N3 swelled um, even after they they uh, shipped it to the CLS. So they charged, they cycled it on site at the Nano One uh, facility. However, it still kind of swelled and puffed up at the CLS. And we were just having a discussion on um, some side reactions that might be happening and how it applies to all. Uh, lithium ion batteries and Eric was advising us that we should keep our phone batteries at around 50% instead of like me. I usually keep it at like 10 to 20. Don't copy that. Anyways. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. So for you guys that are graduating, what was the biggest takeaway from this series? And how do you feel it will carry that forward? Um, we had a question from our in-person audience and she asked for our graduating uh, students like basically everyone all 10 of us except for Brandon what are some of our <laughs> what are some of our key takeaways like some of the main lessons we learned and how we think this project uh, what we learned from this project will help us in future years in our undergraduate careers and beyond. So kind of what Jenna talked about, how collaboration is really important to being successful in an experiment or research project. Uh, going to university, I'm not going to have a lot of knowledge and so are a lot of people there, but finding those resources and connections to help you be successful and gaining that knowledge is really important. And also for the specific program that I'm going into, Food, Nutrition, Health Science, is kind of focused on a lot of chemistry. So kind of getting familiar with these graphs and recognizing them will be super helpful as I go into post-secondary. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, I'm going into astrophysics and one major application of it is synchrotrons and that's what the primary focus of our experiment surrounded, I guess. So all the fundamentals that we learned from the synchrotron stuff is uh, basically what I'll be doing for the next eight years or so. <laughs> So I'm uh, I'm going into material science, and uh, so that's obviously on a nominal level relates to it. But also, unless I misread the website, it also deals a lot with nanostructures, and this was an interesting way to get some firsthand experience with that before I entered university. So uh, I said before I was going to the University of Waterloo for software engineering and it's part of the engineering department. So I would love to get involved in the design teams that they have. One of them is called like Watonomous, which is making autonomous vehicles. And even though my focus is in software, it's really important to when making devices to understand the nature of lithium ion batteries. For example, now many companies have software that uh, changes how fast the battery charges to uh, limit how much the battery is put under stress. First starting this whole project, I knew, well, I thought I knew a little bit about how experimentation and all that works just from previous science classes, but this has definitely opened up my eyes to really what a research project entails. 
which I think will be very beneficial um, in coming years when I'm asked to perform my own research projects and really knowing exactly kind of how much time, effort, and collaboration needs to actually go into that. When I joined the students on the Green Line team, I wanted a science extracurricular activity that can provide a science academic background when applying for post-secondary and the skills such as graphing, collaboration, and communication, I can use those skills when applying for um, the science team inside my post-secondary. Um, I think for me, the biggest takeaway I got was um, how much you can, like you can really accomplish so much if you just put the hours into it. When we first started this project, there was a lot of data, you know, you'd search up lithium on batteries and it was like, whoa, exploding your face. And then you get this data and it's like a lot to kind of handle. And then trying to, when you work with people and you start researching and you start finding little things in, in articles and then you start making connections, it, it really is honestly, it's so satisfying. And it's super cool that, you know, at the beginning you're so frustrated, but actually getting to the point where you finally understand data is super rewarding and super satisfying. And as I continue in my science courses next year, I'm just gonna keep that in mind being like, you know, one step at a time, you're gonna get there, just keep going. Science is a process. And uh, that's something I learned from this project. You know, it's not always a quick answer, like in class, it takes a process sometimes. That's okay, it's a good thing. Well, one thing that drew me to students on the Beamline is that it is student driven. That's like the whole main thing. And I wanted to try something that wasn't like all the courses I was taking that was like teacher teaches something and we learn it and then we take the test. This was um, all us, I mean, with obvious help from our CLS mentors and many other people that helped us out. But oftentimes we would ask a question, they would be like, no, you can figure that out yourself. So that was, that was a big thing. And that's what university is gonna be more like for all of us, yeah. <laughs> um, for me, I'm going to University of Toronto next year for mechanical engineering, and the hope is to go into renewable energy or electric vehicles. So just the knowledge I picked up from the Beamline team is really related to what I'm going into um, and the knowledge I'll need in university. And also going through the process of science is really helpful in terms of what I'll be doing in the future and projects I might have to work on later. Um, I'm going into uh, general sciences at UBC next year, and I think this the students on the Beamline program with its uh, what's that called? It allowed us to go through each step, like each process in the scientific uh, method by ourselves, and so student line project. And I think being able to collaborate with many other experts in the field throughout this journey was just a super cool process. And I learned so much about graphing after I graphed, like Cameron, myself, Eric, William, many of us, We our main focus was on graphing and analyzing the data. I still remember when I spent two hours making a Zane's graph, comparing all of our nano one cell data, like two hours guys and then and then they took it out of the presentation i was heartbroken at the end of it you know even even though i learned even though i learned so much i'm still very saddened by the fact and that's all the faults of kevin de with and brandon delazari so but it's okay i still learned a lot through this process and i'm grateful for everyone for yeah thank you and although I'm not graduating next year, I'll still add my uh, two cents to what I learned from this project. So this is actually my second Students in the Beamline run. And so I already sort of had an idea of how I was going to go and the experimental process. But really what I took away from this one is how valuable collaboration is because our previous project was not nearly as technical. And so just um, sort of being able to reach out and find these answers from other people who are extremely knowledgeable in this space is an invaluable skill. And I feel like that will definitely help me in my future. Are there any other questions in the audience? If not, that will sum up our presentation. Thank you to everyone for coming out. I was going to say just to add on to that, that will conclude our call on um, the Zoom call. So thank you everyone who joined in on the Zoom call as well as in the library there, um, as well as the mentors that stopped in. And um, we'll continue talking, but I will stop the recording. And just again, congratulations. That was really well done, really well spoke. And yeah, just congratulations, you guys. Thank you. Thank you.